And then maybe you sell a million dollars worth of that product and it's more money than you've ever made. And then there's no real long-term plan after that. Well, every single product in the world has a shelf life. And in fact, the more successful the product is, the shorter the shelf life is because the faster you go through your core target audience, if you will, and you, you, you hit that inflection point of you know, law of diminishing returns. And so you'll eventually hit a point where you're spending $1,000 a day on ads and you're only making back $1,000 a day when you used to maybe make $4,000 a day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Bacon. It is, of course, wonderful to have you here. I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, as usual, a quick reminder for those of you who haven't gone out and got it, my new book, People Powered, How Communities Can Supercharge Your Business uh, Brands and Teams, is out right now. Go and grab a copy. But today, I'm thrilled to bring on Mike Dillard. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, Jono. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's great to have you on here. So I first met you um, when I came on your podcast, um, and I think it was my PR team connected me with you, and uh, we had a really cool conversation. And I just I just like the approach that you take to your work. So before we get into that, though, I I, I want to kind of swing through the rap sheet, and I'm going to keep this fairly quick so we can get into the discussion. But uh, it seems like your journey really kind of kicked off with something that you had called magnetic sponsoring, which was a guide that you put together. Uh, back in 2005, and you made a ton of money selling this guide, uh, which was focused on kind of internet marketing, and, and which was really a burgeoning thing that was happening. Um, you went on to to form the Elevation Group, um, where you were working with a whole group of people uh, for how to kind of go through entrepreneurship and making money. Um, I love the fact that you then kind of dug into Evergrow, which was kind of a new approach to um, to the food system, and it was kind of a bit of an experiment. And you, you hired a what was it? The design, I think, it was Whipsaw uh, mm -hmm. to kind of build out this product, and that was an interesting story. Um, and you, you kind of, I see you as kind of one of these marketing leaders and uh, helping entrepreneurs to kind of make, you know, make their their work as effective as possible. But again, like I just think you take a slightly different approach and different tonality to it. So. You know, a really interesting career. You've got a great podcast out there, and, and you recently uh, launched uh, Revenue, um, which people should absolutely go and check out as well. So, thank you for coming on. Yeah, um, you're welcome. So, um, <clears throat> I think what I'd really like to get into, and we kind of talked about this uh, just before we started to hit the record button, is there is a kind of um, a, a growing focus, I think, on digital marketing and direct response marketing. Right? There's a lot of people out there who will say you know, you can make $10,000 a day uh, with 30 minutes worth of work uh, if you just follow my, my proven guide. And as a kind of a cynical Englishman, <laughs> I look at some of this, some of the, the, these, these gurus with a, with a certain amount of not so much suspicion, but I feel like sometimes the front end, the promises that are being made are sometimes quite fantastical, but there's no doubt that there are actually proven ways to sell products online and to captivate interest and 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 you know to write copy that's really interesting and resonates with people just at a broader level like how have you approached this and and kind of how, what's your take on some of this like i say some of these fantastical claims that some of these folks have out there <laughs> yeah you know it's really interesting and it's it's going to be in a very interesting next couple of years because of the whole health crisis that's going on and the economic right. impact that it's having, it's literally forcing millions, if not tens of millions of people around the world into entrepreneurship. And right. on one hand, that's very exciting. And on another hand, I feel empathy for those folks because they're about to enter a jungle without a guide for the most part. <laughs> and yeah. they're going to go through a very expensive and painful you know, journey as, as there is when it comes to mastering any profession. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I look at kind of the sensational headlines that are out there, um, the first thing that I think is, you know, even if that person's results are true and they could very well be, I think they probably are in most cases, they're yeah. only showing the tip of the iceberg uh, of what they can do now and where, based on where their business is now, they're not showing the previous five to 10 years of struggle or failure. 
that it right. took to get them to where they are now. And right now, what they do might be very easy to them. Uh, it would be very easy for me to send a couple of emails and make a significant amount of money. Uh, but I've been doing this for 15 years now. Yeah, you've been doing it forever, right? So. Right. And so that's, on one hand, it, it blurs the <laughs> line. And on one hand, what they're saying could absolutely be true for them. But to set that expectation for new people is doing those new people a disservice. It will certainly help them sell more of their product or course or service or whatever it may be. But uh, but it's going to be part of the learning lesson for the new folks. And so yeah. I try to always take a realistic approach to business and to talk about my struggles and what it realistically took me to build a business. And realistically, it took me five years of business after business, idea after idea, attempt after attempt before I made a single dollar. And right. so most people aren't going to make those sacrifices that I made for those five years to get to that first dollar. And after you make one, well, then it gets really easy to make two. Um, and so what I try to communicate to folks who are coming into this space is that most people look at starting a business as an opportunity or a widget or a thing where it requires a tool or a piece of software or some magic formula that's going to produce a result for them. And it's like an event or where it's like, oop, I did it. I won the game. I make money now. And that's not what it is. What I want to share with folks is that this is a profession. And that was the big changing moment in my career after those five years of struggle is I finally got some tough love from a mentor of mine who said, hey, man, you've been doing this stuff for five years now. You're still struggling. You're not making any money. Do you know why that is? And I said, obviously, I don't. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> he said, he said, it's because you keep thinking that your success is going to come as the result of something outside of yourself. When at the end of the day, if you want to make 50 grand a month, which was my goal at that time, it was my lifelong goal. And I'm, you know, 21, 22 right. years old at the moment. He's like, you have to become someone who's capable of actually achieving that result. He's like, what skills have you mastered? H how have you earned the right to make that kind of money? And that was the big light bulb moment for me that completely changed my life because it was a wake-up call. It was a moment of sobriety. That I think is is super insightful because I think that's the thing that I wrestle with a little bit with some of these other kind of fake gurus mm -hmm. is is it seems to be language such as here's the secret to doing this here's the and it almost as if they're they're saying i've i've discovered the shortcut um that if you set up these specific pieces in this specific order then you will make your 50 grand a month whereas i think what you're saying and certainly my experience in my career as well is um you can take the um you can take that that formula and many elements of that formula will probably work because it's been trial and error as, as, as kind of got to that point. But for, for an entrepreneur to be successful, they need to be able to look at it through the right lens and say, okay, well, why is it designed this way? And if it fails, how do I, how do I understand the data and make changes and make improvements and building those underlying skills, which it sounds like what your mentor was referring to, right? Yeah. The, at the end of the day, it's, your income is tied to your level of skill mastery. And entrepreneurship right. is an entirely new set of skills that people have to acquire. And it's not one, it's dozens, dozens right. of skills. And so what you usually find is people will sell one, one particular skill or part of the process, like let's say how to build a marketing funnel. And, and, and certainly what they're teaching could be correct. Hey, if you put these pieces in this order, your, your chances of generating leads and turning those leads into customers are going to be infinitely higher and you could make sales and money. That's correct. But it also assumes that you have mastered copywriting and the ability to, to write effective sales copy that's going to go on the lead generation page and the sales page and every other part of the process. And so um, there's always an asterisk uh, attached to every single piece of this. And what my journey has looked like um, is that this is a puzzle and every book or course you buy or every event you attend is going to give you one more piece of the puzzle. If you, if you think that buying that is going to give you the entire puzzle, your expectations are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep the expectations where I'm going to get one more piece of the puzzle here and you think about it that way, 
well, then you're going to struggle less. You're going to embrace the learning curve instead of trying to fight it. And you're going to get results much faster. And this is going to be more of a fun process of, you know, actually figuring out the puzzle rather than getting frustrated that it's not done yet. It's it's interesting you mentioned the copywriting piece because I want to get to that in a second because I know that when you I, I saw one of your uh, one of your presentations and you were saying that when you started out on your journey you became a bit of a obsessive copywriting nut mm. <laughs> as you were trying to figure out how this worked and I want to get to that in a second but when 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 people are kind of pitching these these uh, these these formulas, these methods, and these approaches, do you feel like there needs to be a bit more responsibility in the in the industry around it does take that kind of work? Because again, one of the things I like about the approach that you take is you you make it very clear up front. Like I am, I, and just to be, to be very clear to everybody, I have not bought one of Mike's uh, <laughs> products. I'm not, this is not me, the, uh, you know, a, a shrouded sales pitch. I just, from what I've seen of you, you make it very clear, like this is going to require hard work and this is going to, you're going to experience some failure. You're going to experience some difficulty as you get to this. Um, but do you feel like there's a responsibility in people who are selling info products and courses and things like that to set those expectations more crisply? Cause it seems like there are portions of the market that are just not really doing that enough. If you see what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, there's the legal side, uh, when it comes to the FTC and compliance, you know, it's very important that you always have disclaimers in any of your marketing materials that, you know, most people don't get results with this, um, that it takes hard work, et cetera. It takes mastery and things like that. And that income is not guaranteed, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all baseline requirements from a legal perspective. As far as the, the people who are outlandish and over the top with their marketing, I tend not to think about those people or worry about them for two reasons. Uh, first, I think Everything that you buy as a consumer, I know that everything that I bought when I was going through my learning curve served me in one way or another. It served me because I acquired valuable information from it, or it served me in the fact that I, I know not to buy from this person anymore or, or what not to do. And so I just looked at it from that. But finally, I don't really think about these folks or worry about them because at the end of the day, they're not going to be around for very long. At the end of the day, if they're setting these wild expectations and people don't get results and they get complaints on, you know, complaint boards or, you know, uh, scam boards or whatever it may be, the world finds out eventually and they go away. <laughs> and so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, they might make a lot of money in the, in the short term, but in the long term, they're just, they're just not going to be around. So having done this for 15 years now, like these people will come and go, they have been here and always will be here, but most of them are not around anymore. They've just been replaced with the new, the new, the new crowd. Right. Um, and I also tend to think that like attracts like. I, th I think that the people who are not really committed and who are looking to get rich quick or whatever it may be are going to be attracted to those kinds of offers. That's not who I want to work with. So I don't use that language and I attract a different type of person. Um, yeah. So it all balances out. I can understand that as well because it's got to be a risky proposition if you are, kind of, if someone's more on the get rich quick side and someone doesn't get rich quick i imagine that that's it's gonna you're gonna start seeing an avalanche of complaints if you're if your marketing is so so blunt about it i mean all of the you see these videos of people hanging out in front of lamborghinis and mansions and whatever else and i, I get that the success needs to be demonstrated right you need mm. there needs to be the social proof element of it but it seems the thing that i struggle with mike with some of this stuff is it just feels so tacky you know, um, like yeah. some of these people's yeah. like squeeze pages and landing pages, it's like the front of a terrible Reno casino, just flashing buttons and this, that, and the other. Yep. And it, it, I, 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 that's the thing I would wrestle with is, is, is that sense of frankly dignity, you know, is, is not yeah. resorting to those kinds of tactics. Well, here's, yeah, there's, so there's two, there's two more ways to think about this as well. Um, you know, if you get branded, quote unquote, as an internet marketer using all of the flashy stuff, right? It, it has its advantages in one way in that it's going to attract a larger number of people, but it also has disadvantages in the fact that it's going to close doors to, let's say, bigger opportunities down the road with, you know, real brands like, you know, you could mm. do a brand or influencer deals with Nike or Ferrari or whomever. 
those right, doors right. are going to be shut to you because they don't want to associate with you. Now, on the other hand, I can tell you this, that it's a tough spot as a business owner if you're actually letting the market dictate what they want to buy. So an example of this means we could take that flashy sales page and then we could also put a very clean, subtle, professional version of it with the same copy, but the look and feel is completely different, A and B. And we can run a split test from our traffic to those two pages. And let's say you're selling a $1,000 course that is a phenomenal product. It's the best quality on the market. And let's say that the flashy page converts at three times the rate as the conservative one. And now you're making 300 grand a month instead of $100,000 a month. What do you do? Because in one, you know, in one way of thinking about that, where you're putting up both with equal traffic, I'm going to let the customer and market dictate what they want and let them vote with their dollars, which they have. Mm. And what do you do now? <laughs> yeah. So, it, well, and that's interesting as well, because that then, in my mind, fundamentally then opens up a very core challenge in that marketeer, which is, to your point earlier on, Mike, what is the balance between the short-term rewards and then the long-term, longer-term reputational elements to this? Yes, um, exactly. Because, uh, and I get the impression that this is probably a challenge. This is a, a very sweeping statement, but I imagine this is more of a challenge with Americans compared to Europeans as well. Like, I didn't grow up in an environment with a lot of... Um, uh, the kind of these kind of get rich quick type stuff. Um, it's it's. I know a lot of my my um, American friends uh, who grew up in America said that this you know there was a lot of kind of um, catalogs would have ads in them for these kind of get rich quick schemes and you'd mail them out and you get your CDs through the post or your tapes through the post and things like that. So it's just culturally a little bit little bit different in England, and I can imagine that if you have been born and raised in a capitalist society like the US. Um, you look at, well, hang on a second, I'm getting three times more revenue from this, you know, kind of more clickbaity style of method. That's the right answer, because that's kind of what's to a degree part of the culture is dictated. And I'm judging it based upon the success. It's got to be more difficult to then say, okay, let's take the longer view, which might result in less short term revenue, but potentially longer term opportunities down the line, right? Yeah. And that's, that's the, the decision people have to have to make, right? Like if you look at a Ty Lopez, Ty's a right. brilliant dude. Like he's literally like Asperger's level genius. Yeah. Um yeah. like I've 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 had dinner with him a couple of times at at some other events. And right. I would never ever do the ty- the style of marketing he does with the Ferraris and the girls and all of that and all of those things. Right. Yeah. But Ty's my my age. He's 42 as well. And if you ask him, why did you do that, Ty? He's like, because that's what you have to do to generate interest and get attention from your target audience so that you can ultimately help them with hmm. the, the knowledge that they need. And, right. and that's another, that's another catch 22 where it's like, well, do you, do you sacrifice your personal reputation in that way in order to serve and help more people? Right. You know, maybe. And, and that's just going to be an individual choice that, and decision that every single person is going to have to make. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think a lot no, of it just changes with age too. You know, I, I can say I was certainly had different priorities and was probably attracted to different things at 25 than I am now. Yeah. So. Which is perfectly normal, right? Yeah. 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 So this kind of like neat, quite rather neatly leads on to the copywriting piece because, um, like I say, I saw you, uh, in one of your videos, you talked about how, um, when you first got interested in this, you, you got really deeply into copywriting and mm. uh, and this is not something i had a lot of experience with until like when we last talked when i came in your podcast i was just starting to learn about this whole world of internet marketing in a greater mm-hmm. level of detail because i'm a consultant i work with companies directly i've never done any marketing like my clients come to me it sounds egotistical and it's not meant to but you know i have a niche and and i get get, get referrals through for, through various people and they come to me and we build out communities but I was just interested in learning more about this world. So the role of copy I find fascinating because clearly the construction and utilization of language plays a significant role in converting interest into sales um, and getting people through the funnel. Mm. But could you talk a little bit about kind of what you discovered in that phase? Because obviously you must have had that aha moment that 
the the role of copy is really important here. And yeah. what did you discover in that phase? And to what extent do you think it it plays? Like, is it is it a major component of a successful internet marketing mm. campaign, yeah. or is it a smaller piece of it? Uh, so my discovery of copywriting was inspired by my absolute fear and terror of selling anything to anyone when I was in college and, and wanting to start a business for the first time. So that's oh, kind of when I caught the bug and I was shy and introverted and insecure. And I wanted Is that to what make the fear money. was? You were just kind of nervous about, was it being kind judged. of the fear of what people would think? Right. Yeah. Got being it. judged yeah. And, and just putting myself out there. And, and, and when you're introverted and don't have confidence selling is probably the most intimidating thing in the world. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh and and so that was part of the that five years of failure cycle for me is it's hard to build a business and make money when you don't know how to sell, you're not willing to. And so I had mm. to find a solution to that. And the solution I found was copywriting. And lo and behold, I discovered that you could actually write the full sales, you know, presentation using a specific psycho, uh, psychology formula. Um that would walk people through the entire process of introduction to rapport building and pain and you know all of that stuff through to the call to action and getting the sale. And that was a massive moment for me because it finally gave me the ability to do what I wanted, which was to build a business and make money without having to go directly face that fear that I had at the time that was debilitating. So I, st I spent about a year, year and a half studying and mastering copywriting and learning how to write a sales presentation and learning how to write ads that you know will generate clicks and leads. And I mastered that skill over the course of about one to two years. And it was life-changing. And so from that moment on, I, instead of having to cold call you know, people a day or buying leads or you know, going door to door, I could then just write a sales page and put that up on the internet and then write an ad on Google AdWords and put that up on the internet and people would buy my product and I would never have to talk to them. And so <laughs> that was epiphany number one. Epiphany number two was that it allowed me to uh, achieve scale. Meaning when I was first getting started again in college doing direct sales, the amount of money that I could potentially make was directly correlated to the number of people I would speak to in person or over the phone every single day. And so I would push myself to do those things, even though I was super uncomfortable and I hated it. But I looked up at the mentors who were doing really well at that time. They might be able to make, you know, 10 really thorough sales calls a day that last 30 minutes to an hour. And they might, if they're one of the best in the world, close four out of four or five out of those 10. And, and that's, that's it. That's all they can do. And they have to wake up and do that every single day. Which is exhausting. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> if that's what this looks like for 20 years, I don't want to have any part of this. And I was like, well, what if I wasn't quite as effective at that close rate? What if I could only close 10% or even 5%? But what if I could give this same presentation to 10,000 people a day online? It's like, I win every single time. And I'm not having to speak to anyone in the process, which means my time is free. I now have leverage. And that is how I went from waiting tables at PF Chang's to making my first million bucks by the age of 27 was figuring out that ad copy piece. And what I want people to think about and realize is that when you're selling a product or service online, you're doing it remotely. You're not talking to the individual on the phone. You're, not, you're likely not talking to them in any shape or form or fashion. And so copywriting is essentially, you know, uh, persuasive, persuasive uh, writing is the language of the internet. It's the language of commerce on the internet. And if, if somebody is reading my copy or, or watching a sales video, that copy has to do 100% of the job to generate the sale without my participation. And if it doesn't, then I don't get the sale. And so it literally is the language of the internet if you want to do commerce online. What do you think is the balance, though, between, um, I guess you could say, content, so what mm. the copy is telling you, and the tonality of it? Because um, I get the impression that with a lot of copy that works, first of all, the thing that it's talking about is compelling and it's interesting, mm. but a lot of it is about kind of the voice and the tone that it comes across, that mm. it's that it feels engaging, like it's the difference between writing corporate press reading corporate press releases um and kind of like blog posts i guess you could say like they're written in very very different styles how would you describe that with copywriting 
Copywriting is designed to engage emotion and then and then follow that up with logic. And so whenever people buy based on emotion and they justify that purchase based on logic, I want to buy that Ferrari because of the emotion that I have attached to driving that kind of car. And I might justify that purchase after learning that Ferraris hold their resale value better than any other sports car brand in the world. And that's <laughs> that's an actual right. real world example from my life. So cars are my biggest passion. I, I'm a professional race car driver. I, I compete. I've won the Mint 400. Um, no, I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. So that's my passion is, is cars. And I've owned you know a dozen different supercars, if you will. And one of the primary sales tactics that you know, got me to buy my first Ferrari was that argument from the sales guy where it's like, Hey, by the way, uh, you know, you can design this car spec it any way you want. We're going to have the factory build it to you. It'll be here in about four or five months. And on average, because you're going to be one of the first customers of this new model, you can drive this for the next year, put three to 6,000 miles on the car. And, you know, we'll probably end up buying it back from you if you'd like to sell it back to us for, you know, within 10 grand of what you paid for it. Sound fair? Right. And I'm like, I'm in because he engaged the emotion <laughs> right. and gave me the justification that I needed from a logic perspective. And that's when the purchase is made. And so from a copy perspective, those are the types of uh, psychological triggers, if you will, that go into creating effective copy that are missing from any other kind of you know, corporate-esque communication online. Uh, most corporate communication is not trying to engage your promotion, your, your emotions. It's not trying to um, create a, a picture of taking you from where you are now to where you want to be. It's not trying to uh, reduce in, or eliminate any kind of risk that you would have in the deal, which is another important part of selling a product online. And ultimately, you know, I could make some pretty bold promises about my product or courses if I wanted to. And at the end of the day, because we have a 30-day money-back guarantee, the customer is the ultimate judge of whether I or not I fulfilled on that promise. And so I think that's what you, you see a lot of this over the top stuff around. People are okay doing that because again, at the end of the day, if the customer isn't satisfied with what they purchased, they get their money back. That's it, period. And so there, the customer still is, uh, you know, the ultimate source of power in this entire relationship. In the whole thing. Yeah. And when you were getting into that, because um, when you were learning that, that that phase, the copywriting piece. And you touched on this earlier, Mike, about there's so many pieces to this. Like if you just look at a just a a sales funnel, there is the there are the different components such as there's the ad copy and the ad targeting. And then there's the, you know, the content of the of the squeeze page. There is the mm. lead magnet that you offer. All of these different pieces kind of factor into the process. And and I agree with you earlier on when you were talking about um, like how you perfect and learn and grow each of those different elements. But when you were focusing on the copywriting piece and you were back in your early 20s, how did you go about perfecting that skill? Because, you know, a lot of people talk about, for example, split testing is running mm. different different um, versions of the copy for people who are less familiar with this, who are listening, running different versions and then seeing how people respond. Uh, and I think that's going to be probably primarily about whether they engage whether it's the, the execution of the call to action that you've, mm -hmm. you've presented. How did you go about doing that? And and what what did you learn through that process as you started to refine it and started to see the results coming through? So, you know, when it comes to copywriting, there's two primary things that you need to do. First, go out and buy as many books and courses as you can on copywriting and just go through all of them. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on, on different right. courses and products on copywriting. But the key to success that's going to help you understand, it's going to give you the psychology, it's going to help you understand the formulas. But the key to getting really good at it really fast is by taking the most successful marketing pieces that you see around or that you know have existed in the past. These are ads that you're seeing everywhere all the time. Because if you're seeing th this particular ad everywhere all the time, that means they're spending a ton of money, which means it's making them a ton of money. So it's effective, right? And so uh, what we would do is write those out by hand. And so I might take a sales video or a written sales letter that I know has made millions of dollars. And I would go out and write that by hand every night for about an hour until my hand got tired. And what that's going to do is it's, it's like learning how to play a musical instrument. That's all this is. 
is at the end of the day, copywriting is based on patterns. It's based on language patterns, sentence patterns, structure, uh, storytelling patterns, all of the above. And by writing those out by hand, it's allowing your brain to pick up on those patterns subconsciously and learn them and to learn the vocabulary and to learn the certain set of transitions to go from one part to the next part of the story to the next part of the story. And it does it in a way that your conscious brain is not going to pick up just by reading a course on how to do it. And so that is the secret to learning how to master copy is to, is to go write that out by hand for about a year, which is what it took Practice. me. Right. And yeah. You know, the, the analogy that I give is, you know, whenever you're around someone who has a foreign accent, and all of a sudden, within a few minutes, you start to have change your inflection points and you, you start to pick up on that accent. And you don't even <laughs> you know do why you're You sound very English it. right now, by the way, Mike. Yeah. Very English. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't, you know, maybe you're, you know, around someone Spanish and all of a sudden you start having this Spanish inflection and you're just like, right. where in the world did that come from? And that's <laughs> your brain picking up on that language pattern. And mm. it's going to do the same thing as you start to write copy. You're going to start, if you just read my copy and started to write out my sales letters, you're going to end up talking like me. Um, right. And that's the shortcut. Interesting. And what would you say is uh, the, the, this kind of gets me thinking about in recent years? We've, um, it certainly seems like the attention span for people has been shortening because. Mm -hmm. Uh, social media has got us used to short chunks of content. Um, it's become very common when I recommend this to my clients, you know, in, when they're creating content that for example, videos are short and focused, high value. Uh, like I did a, a Facebook live session this morning, um, and went through nine tips in a video in 20 minutes. Right. So it seems like people have a, a shorter and shorter attention span. W what is the role of that with copywriting? Because some of these sales letters that people have on these on these pages, and again, for people who are less familiar with this, who are listening, a sales letter is is kind of it's the page that you might look at that kind of goes through and sets the scene and 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 delivers the emotion, and then and then the ultimate kind of product or the lead magnet. Um, what would you say is the is is the role of length now is that changing have you seen over the course of your career that people just don't want to read as much when they're when they're yeah. reading these sales letters well here's what it comes down to that most most people don't get is selling a product has to do with with trust period can i trust that if i buy this i'm going to get what is being delivered or promised and so that's why most companies focus so much time, effort, and money on building brand because the brand creates familiarity, familiarity creates trust. And so if sales conversion is directly tied to the level of trust, trust is generally best built through time. It's earned through time. And so when you look at the long form sales copy or maybe an hour and a half long webinar, those presentations are designed to take a complete stranger who has zero prior knowledge of you or experience with you and to take them through every single part that you would need to take a complete stranger through until they would feel comfortable pulling out their credit card and purchasing a product from a stranger. And so that webinar, you know, for generally the general rule of thumb is, is that someone needs to spend an hour with you to feel comfortable spending a thousand dollars with you. So when we sell my, you know, previous courses that I had for sale, our price was $1,500 and our sales webinar was an hour and a half. And that was intentional. Uh, and that's also the case because we were marketing that to complete strangers who have never seen or heard of me before. So that's the bare minimum amount of time they would need to feel comfortable purchasing a $1,500 product. Now that has changed quite a bit because social media has allowed people to essentially get to know me and spend more time with me in micro doses. It might be a 15 second story. It might be a 30 minute podcast, a 15 minute YouTube video, but cumulatively they are going to spend at least an hour with me most likely in the next, you know, one to 30 days. And now I can make a much shorter offer because that trust and rapport is already there. And I can just say, Hey, if you have this problem, we have a solution, go check it out. Your, your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. Right. And so it could be a five minute pitch at that point. So that's uh, the primary, the primary differentiators. You have to think about who is my target audience? Is this going out to people who are brand new and it's a completely cold market? 
or is this going out to my warm market? And that's really going di- to dictate the length of the presentation. And, and uh, so it's about kind of building that relationship through, mm-hmm. and like you say, it can be broken into lots of smaller pieces. Yeah. Um, so historically, certainly from a lot of the things that I've seen, everybody would always talk about the value of the list, the value of the email list mm. that, you know, is that it, it's something that's an asset that you've got. Um, you can, you can start delivering sequence emails out to people. Uh, you can use email lists for things like uh, uh, advertising, retargeting and things like that. But also email has become so oversubscribed in recent years and Gmail, for example, are filtering out promotions and updates and things like that. What do you see the role as email these days? Do you think that the list is so central? Uh, so for example, Russell Brunson, for, so people who don't know who Russell Brunson is, he's the uh, the CEO of ClickFunnels, which is a service that uh, a lot of people use for setting up sales funnels. Mm-hmm. He recently ran a course called List Building Secrets. And he, to this day, says, you know, the, the, the list is, is the most critical thing you can focus on. Yeah. Where do you see the role of email today, Mike? Uh, still 100% agreed. Hundred percent agreed. Um, you know, despite the you know the the delivery challenges and and filtration and things like that, your email list is still by far and away the most valuable asset you have. For me, if you have an online business, your email list is your business because I want you to think about it as a virtual distribution channel where I have complete ownership and control of that, and I can go send an email and reach my entire audience with a couple of clicks and full control. Um, you know, Starbucks has their network of stores. I have my email list. That's how I generate sales. And so um, the ownership part of that is absolutely key. If you build up as many people have, let's say a million fans on your Facebook page, and then all of a sudden Facebook stops delivering your content to your people, it's useless. And the same thing happens with Instagram. And so same thing happens with YouTube. If you violate YouTube's policies or they don't like what you're talking about with, you know, we just saw that happen with Brian Rose this last week, YouTube channel gets, gets taken away and 10 years of work disappears. Your entire business disappears. So, so you want to have all of them, but the core heart of your business and its value is your email list because I've taken that email list from business to business to business. I have people who are still reading my emails that have been on it for 15 years and that relationship, at the end of the day, the list is irrelevant. Um, the value from the list is derived from the quality of the relationship you have with your readers. That's why you can't go out and buy a list. If you were to, if I were to give you my list, Jono, you're not going to get any results from it because there's no, no trust and rapport yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the list is an asset, but the value of the list is determined by the level of trust you have with your readers. Um, yeah. That's how you know, we can send a a recommendation for a product, you know, an investing product that I personally use and love. You know, a year and a half ago, I sent sent out a recommendation to my audience and I just said, hey guys, if you're into this market, which is the crypto market, which I've been buying Bitcoin since 2013, go check out this newsletter. It's the best research I found in that industry. And uh, I sent out four emails over the course of a week and we did a 50-50 rev share with the owner of that publication. So it sold for two grand. So every customer of mine who purchased, I made a thousand dollar commission. I made $578,000 in a week just by <laughs> sending out four emails talking about a product that I personally use and love. And it's like, it's yeah. awesome. And if you're into this, go buy it. And that's that. And that's the value of the channel. And that makes sense because people are, uh, I guess at this point, they're, they, look, they're, 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 they're continuing to stay subscribed. So therefore they, they're interested in your views and your, and mm-hmm. your recommendations. It makes sense. How do you, um, when you, when you approach your email list, um, it strikes me that the most important thing here is going to be primarily delivering value to people, right? Mm-hmm. So I've ended up, um, uh, let me give you an example that kind of, acts as a, a, a context for this this next part of the discussion. The, the, uh, obviously, I'm not going to mention who it is, but there's mm-hmm. a guy who I think is a very accomplished um, entrepreneur, and he's got a, a pretty pretty good book. Um, and I, I got onto his email list, and every day he sent me email. So it was once a day. And I understand why he's doing this, because um, just the, he's wanting to build that trust in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, but it seemed like about probably about 60 to 70% of these emails that I were I was receiving 
were actively selling. They're actively trying to get something, me to buy something. And it was too soon. It was one of those situations mm. where there was just too much email coming in. And I actually emailed him and I said, look, you seem like a nice guy, but this is too much, right? Sending me email every day for me personally, and maybe I'm the weird exception. It's, 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 it's smothering in, in many ways, particularly as the content of the email is not in my mind, particularly valuable. You're just trying to sell me more stuff. Mm. But then I'll contrast it with, um, um, I had on on this podcast, a guy called Rahul Vora, who was the CEO of a company called Superhuman. And they've got an email service. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of, it's 30 bucks a month. So people are, you know, why would I pay for this when I can get Gmail for free? But it's just a really efficient email tool. And I love it. And I had him on the show to talk about it. And one of the things I said to him was, when you sign up as a customer for Superhuman, you get an email every day, but it's with, here's how you do something. Here's some value you can get from the product. And I read every single one of those emails. So these are two very different uses and perspectives on email. So I get the impression that the 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 frequency of the email coming in, as well as whether it's value or whether it's just selling, um, d- completely influences the perspective that somebody has with that person. But obviously, email is a channel for sales. How have you st- struck the balance between frequency, value, and kind of like offers, I guess you could say? Yeah. Um, you know, it's Gary Vaynerchuk's jab, 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 right hook, right? And right. so there's no there's no one, one size fits all approach to it. I simply yeah. try to treat my audience as the way I would want to be treated. And you know, the since you and I have met each other, you've never really seen my approach to email because the last two years, my my level of email has gone down to almost zero, meaning it's basically I've been emailing my list once a week when I have a new podcast episode come out or if we're holding some kind of promotion for a sale or product or, or something along those lines, which is, um, you know, from a health perspective, all I was really capable of. But before that, for many years, I became known for my email list and the emails I sent because my goal was to always send an email that would someone be would be happy that they opened and read. That was the the bar or the filter that I would use to send down an email. And so if I didn't have anything that would meet that qualification that day, then I wouldn't send an email. I might I might go a week without sending one until maybe a, a story or a life event inspired me to share a lesson that I think would be valuable to the audience. And so that's really the general kind of overhead 50,000 foot view that I use when it comes to that. Now, you know, as far as frequency goes, there is the the largest, probably most successful online publishing company in the world, Agora, does about a billion dollars a year in revenue. They have tested this six ways to Sunday over the last 30 years. But Every their their results are best found when they mail every single day. Now the difference is, and that's because it creates habitual consumption. You become a part of that person's daily routine in the morning or whatever it may be, and so that's very important. But the difference is also is that their emails are really valuable. Like they have an entire staff of copywriters and editors uh, and experts that produce their content, and so they balance all three parts of it, frequency with quality with offers. At that point, it's almost like a newspaper, right? Is that you're getting the morning, in this case, it's not news, but Mm -hmm. the reason why you read a newspaper, well, back in the day, you'd read a newspaper every day was because there was valuable material on those pages, right? So it sounds like their approach is they're delivering, maybe it's guidance and tips and whatever else. Yeah, financial education and things like that, you know, stock, stock information. Um. At the end of the day, the, the, I think the most successful approach to email is, is the tone and frame in which you write it. And for me, that has always been as if I'm writing to my friends. So, you know, I try to use my email platform almost not quite. I could do a better job at this, but almost as a diary where, again, if I've got something valuable to share, if I've learned something or if we went on a trip or we've got an interesting photo that I can share, I involve my readers in that in my life. Pictures from Christmas or a vacation or a race or whatever it may be. So that it, they feel like they're participating in my life. It is basically the email version of Instagram. Um, and so that is what creates a bond. That's what creates a friendship and what creates rapport. And that's when you end up going to an event and maybe speaking and 100 people come up 
to talk to you and they can quote back things from my life from the past 10 years and they feel like right. they're a friend of mine even though we've never met before. Yeah. Um, so I that's how it. I think I about it. Yeah. Well, I, what I and again, what I love about your approach, Mike, here is it 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 is fundamentally the core of everything you talk about is centered on on in my mind the right things. It's authenticity, it's it's building a relationship. It's not um this is a group of people that I can throw um, just brightly colored advertising and sales pitches towards um, because yeah. that, you know, I was chatting to someone last week and he was saying, you know, one of the problems a lot of marketeers make is that they, you know, they work so hard to get people to sign up for their email list. And then mm -hmm. they just basically, they just end up frustrating them and then they leave because it be, turns into just a bombardment of this kind of material. And so I, li I like the approach that you're taking. What do you think? I, I know we're kind of coming to the end and I want to make sure I get you out the door on time because I know you've got to, you've got to get out, but um, how have you seen the role of advertising shift and adjust over time in your career? Because, you know, um, obviously Facebook in recent years has become a bit of a controversial figure when it came to things like Cambridge Analytica and whatever mm -hmm. else, but it's by far, it certainly seems to me, like the most um, favored and successful advertising platform when it comes to social media. What's your overall take on this? Do you think it's Facebook? Do you think people should be focusing on Google ads, uh, YouTube ads? Yeah. How, how, how have you seen that shift? It's never, there has never been a, a better time to be an entrepreneur than today. The right. access to the tools and capabilities that we have today are unbelievable. It's unprecedented, which creates a scenario that you know, is basically the good news is that it's easier to become an entrepreneur than ever. The bad news is that it's easier to become an entrepreneur than ever. I mean, we <laughs> run into the issue we have, which is all so many people doing it now. And now because right. it is so simple and easy, you know, when I got started, I had to learn HTML and code my own web pages, right? Right. And so right. now that it's so easy, so many people can do it, the barrier to entry is so low, it's basically flooded the market. And mm. this flood of of individuals are all fighting for the attention of essentially the same group of people within any niche and that's right. why you see the sensational battle for attention go up um and so it's it's better than it's ever been as far as efficiency goes advertising efficiency is off the charts now where i can retarget anyone who's like been to one specific site on my web page and or watched a certain amount of a, of a video that I've posted online, I can put an ad just in front of those 50 people. The right. amount of efficiency around ad spend is unprecedented. Now, with that in mind, the level of skill and technical expertise required to do that is also higher. It's not mm. like you can throw up a Google AdWords campaign like I did when I first got started in a half an hour and put in a bunch of keywords and hit go and get a positive right. result because you are competing. Whoever is the most efficient with their ad spend wins. And you are right. competing against the best of the best in the world out there. So I have personally spent all of my time and energy focused on two things, which is creating a world-class product and a, world cl a world-class sales presentation or marketing plan, if you will, in order to right. generate leads and make sales because that's what I can control and what I'm good at. And as far as the advertising side of the house goes, that's an entire other level of professionalism and expertise that other individuals are now dedicating their entire lives to managing, running, and, and staying on top of. These would right. be the, the Facebook agencies that are that are out there that you can hire. And so that's what I do. I've always right. taken care of that. And then I've handed off the traffic and marketing to an agency who's responsible for their campaigns. They know it better than I ever will. And that yeah. combination is kind of the super duo that you need to really scale and, and blow up a business and you know scale it to seven or eight figures. Right. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So as we bring this into the finish line, um, I guess the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is, is throughout the course of your career, what would you say are the one or two things that have been most insightful to you and what you've discovered? Because I think you've, you've had a really fascinating career. You've, you've gone in a number of different directions, but you've clearly perfected your craft. What are the couple of things that you've really kind of discovered and then what do you think what's most on your mind for for the next couple of years for you mike uh back during my first business i i discovered and and just could see a direct correlation between the amount of money i invested in my education and the amount of money that i made 
And so the mm. more money that I bought on books, courses, mastermind groups, et cetera, the, the higher my income went up. And right. so that was, and still is one of, I think the most important factors that they're in and, and, and that people need to get over and not look at spending money on education as an expense, but rather an investment that produces Just an investment, ROI. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, other than that, it's taking a long-term perspective and approach and having patience, especially in this world, you know, in the traditional business world, three to five years would be like, you're still in the first phase of starting up the company. <laughs> And right. in yeah. the internet marketing world, three to five years is like, it's an entire cycle where at the end of five years, you might not even have that business anymore. Um, and so I would suggest that folks really keep a long-term perspective of more of a 10 to 15 year window and to build their business with that kind of a vision and plan rather than falling into the trap of, oh, I'm going to create one product and sell it. And then maybe you sell a million dollars without that product and it's more money than you've ever made. And then there's no real long-term plan after that. Well, every yeah. single product in the world has a shelf life. And in fact, the more successful the product is, the shorter the shelf life is because the faster you go through your core target audience, if you will. And right. You reach your market quicker, right? You, you, you hit that inflection point of you know, law of diminishing returns. And so- you'll eventually hit a point where you're spending $1,000 a day on ads and you're only making back $1,000 a day when you used to maybe make $4,000 a day. Well, at that yep. point, you maybe pull the, pull the plug and there's no more advertising for that product and it's kind of dead. And so people need to understand that that will 100% happen. Uh, what's the long-term plan afterward? And so mm. people don't mm. tend to think that far to step two and step three and step four. Um, right. but they should be, or you're going to have, you're going to find yourself starting over again, you know, five years from now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And what's next for you? You know, what are you, what's exciting you right now in terms of the next um, year or so? Yeah. I mean, we've got, we've got revenue, the, this, this basically mastermind group. We, we started at the beginning of this whole crisis to help guide entrepreneurs through this. Yeah. Tell us a little uh, bit about that for people who are not familiar yeah. with that. So. so it's, it's uh, revenue spelled with two V's. So kind of like rev up your revenue. And we launched this about six weeks ago, and the the whole idea was I've been through you know several crises as an entrepreneur before. After the crash of 08, I pivoted my business. We launched a new product within 60 days. It made 3.2 million in sales in our first seven days in business. Right. Um, and so I have a lot of experience navigating this kind of upset of the the, the chessboard, if you will. So we mm. started this little mastermind group to help provide uh, business owners with, with guidance, knowledge, and expertise to, to navigate these times and to turn, turn them into an opportunity is really what our goal is. Um, so that's kind of the primary project that I have right now. We're, I don't know if you know this, John, or not. We are actually launching this week, and we've reduced the price all the way down to 97 bucks for a lifetime membership. Oh, cool. Um, so this is someone anybody can join. The only requirements are that you own some kind of business. And that you have a great attitude and that's it. And you can join yep. the mastermind group and, and jump on our weekly calls. Um, yep. Well, I've been in after, there and it's, uh, and it's awesome. I think it's great yeah. what you built there. So yeah, yeah, we've got a bunch of amazing people in it. Uh, and then my next chapter after going through this health stuff is that I had my life essentially saved by a handful of doctors and people who were there for me. Oh, um, wow. I consider them superheroes in my mind. And so I'm, uh, you know, in the beginning stages of dedicating the next 10 to 15 years of my life to helping people who are making a, a, a big impact on people, but they're not necessarily doing it at scale yet. So maybe they're a therapist, maybe they're a doctor, maybe they're a coach of some kind or a consultant, and they're doing amazing work and right. they're helping change people's lives, but they don't know how to do it at scale. And so we're going to build a company that helps those people essentially build a large audience, uh, build their influence in the world, make a bigger impact, and, and ideally also help them increase their income so that they can live an amazing lifestyle as well. That's so awesome. that's going to be, yeah, um, yeah my, next, my next phase here. Love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Mike. You know, as you know, I, I love the approach that you take to this and, and folks can go and find out more about you at MikeDillard.com. I'll make sure I get that into the, into the podcast notes. And by the time this episode comes out, um, uh, the, the, the $97 thing that Mike was referring to will already be out there. So yeah. go and yep. check it out, go and check out revenue. 
Uh, and thanks, Mike, and all the best for the future. Jono, thanks so much for having me, brother. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.